when um, Yumi reached out to me, I was really pleased to contribute to this uh, as aspect of the, the impact of specifically the cost of living crisis to employees. And as Nikki mentioned, our journey, we've been measuring engagement now for uh, since our first list of the best companies to work for was uh, published in 2001. So we've been at it a long, long time, 23 years in actual fact. And in that time, we've measured, um, I think, six and a half million employees from about five and a half, six thousand different organizations. And as Nikki mentioned, that spans um, organizations from as little as 25 employees all the way up to 25,000, indeed, sometimes 100,000 plus employees. Um, but sort of where I wanted to start uh, this session was really just to sort of explain um, what sort of that original vision was to, was to help make the world a better workplace. And as Nikki mentioned, I attended a servant leadership conference in Indianapolis in the States. And that's where I first came across the number one and number two best company to work for as published in Fortune magazine. And uh, the number one, Sonova's Financial, was a bank based in Columbus, Georgia, uh, man managing, I think at the time, $26 billion worth of assets. So you kind of would have expected that organization to be a great workplace, very profitable, very comfortable, et cetera. But what was really particularly interesting to me was the second best company to work for in 2000 was a company called TD Industries, an electromechanical contracting business based out of Dallas, Texas. So this organization was manufacturing ducting and pipe work for sort of industrial applications. And I was really quite surprised because here's an organization in the sort of mechanical engineering space that was doing better than Microsoft when it comes to engagement. And um, I got the opportunity to visit both companies beyond that um, when I sort of felt that what I'd like to do as a business leader was I wanted to be one of those best companies to work for, that the sessions that they held inspired me to do so. But there wasn't a list, so perhaps my job was to help to create one. So when I actually visited both Sonobus and, and TD Industries, um, I'd done my homework and you know done my research, and I got to measure, um, uh, visit lots of different organizations like um, Cisco, uh, Intel, um, uh, lots of different uh, organizations over in the States to really understand what made great organizations and highly engaged organizations. And one of the things that when I visited TD Industries, uh, in my research, I found out that they happened to be employee owned. And, and, and obviously that, that I thought was very significant. And I mentioned to the CEO, um, Jack Lowe, who was the son of the founder of the business, I said, you know, how significant is it that you are employee owned organization and the second best company to work for in the whole of America? He said, I don't think it's relevant at all. And we're in his office and we walked over to this window overlooking the, um, uh, the workshop and he pointed down to this really big Texan. He was a big Texan fella, um, but this really big fella down working on this machine. And he said, this chap actually has more shares in this organization than I do. And I'm the son of the founder. And he said that the only difference is, is that, you know, um, he himself is doing his job. He uh, expects me to do my job. The only difference here is that he could vote me out at any time. So one of the factors that we know about, and we'll talk about in a moment, is organizations uh, need to be well-led, well-managed, and have growth and development opportunities. And if we're providing those as an organization, then it's likely or not we're going to have strong engagement. The one thing I didn't mention when I listened to the original presentation from TD Industries and Synovus was that they showed a video, specifically Synovus, of what they were doing, not just for their organization, but for their communities. And I have to confess, the video brought a tear to my eye, really evoked emotion. And I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be a great workplace. But at the end of the presentation, uh, they showed a, um, a, a chart. Um, charting the performance of the Standard & Poor Index, which is the sort of American version of the FTSE Index. And it demonstrated that in that year of the 100 best companies to work for in America, for those that were publicly quoted, they were outperforming that index by a factor of three times. So quite frankly, engaging employees um, delivers better financial results and indeed sustainability. Now, one of the things that I know a lot of uh, individuals get slightly confused about, and I've been asked the question over the last 23 years, 
what actually is the difference between satisfaction and engagement? Well, we found this model. Um, it's not our model. It's a model created by an American psychologist called James A. Russell back in 1980. And he was looking to um, research human emotion, not just in the workplace, but anywhere. And we've subsequently found that there's a direct correlation relationship between um, emotion and how people are engaged in the world of work. So this model shows unpleasant emotions on the left, pleasant emotions on the right, low mental activation at the bottom and high mental activation at the top. Where satisfaction lies, which a lot of organizations still measure this, is a pleasant but inactive low mental activation state where people are satisfied, content, pleased. They come, they do their work, they have perhaps a nice time with colleagues, but they're not particularly engaged with what their manager or indeed their leaders are trying to achieve in the organization. What we want to do is keep it pleasant, but move to that higher mental activation where people are engaged, enthusiastic and excited. So this is the optimal place to be. And that's where this terminology in uh, years gone that talk about discretionary effort. Um, that is where you get that discretionary effort. Now, obviously, it's been a challenging time for many over this last three years. But, you know, high mental activation is considered a good thing. And by and large, it is. But because of that uncertainty that the, the last three years have brought, uh, um, brought with it from COVID perspective and now the cost of living crisis, it has actually tipped people into this anxious zone where it, it moves over to this unpleasant, where people become anxious, distressed, indeed hostile. And that is where they're unclear about their future and that, you know, their role within the organization, their financial security, et cetera. And, and obviously, during the pandemic, even down to their health, you know, whether or not they that they were, became anxious about that. So this is not a good place to be because it reduces the bandwidth of ability to do great work, because while you're anxious, you're not you're, you're reducing that ability to do great work. Finally, you've got unpleasant and low mental activation where people are bored, depressed and blue. And this is uh, certainly a, a something we've seen in our data where going through um, the lockdown period of the pandemic, and, and that's even continued with this different ways of working. People have started to disengage with organizations and lose that connection. And that's the opportunity for organizations to make sure they keep connected to their employees, however they're choosing to work. Now, we developed a snapshot methodology, and it's important to remember this is a snapshot methodology. But by asking two simple questions, are you zero stressed, um, 10 calm, zero bored, 10 enthusiastic, we're able to populate this chart. And this chart is a more granular model that we've developed with the benefit of the six and a half million records. This is the optimal place to be, highly engaged. This is the suboptimal place to be, highly disengaged, where people are actively looking to leave the organization. And what we found was, was that this is the best place, then the second best place, third, fourth, this place is an interesting one because this is where neutrality sits and that's where people don't have strong emotions either way. And, and the reason why that's interesting is it's a lot easier to move people from this neutral zone to the pleasant side than it is to try and drag people kicking and screaming from this zone eye. Now, I'm not saying for one minute it's impossible to move people from this zone nine, but um, it takes a disproportionate amount of effort because they're kind of already checked out. Now, um, I thought what would be interesting for you is uh, we measure uh, organizations. Yes, we produce league tables, and we do that now every quarter uh, with the final league table coming out in November. So just literally last month, uh, the, the whole four quarters. Um, but what we also do is we recognize organizations based on a similar standard to the Michelin food standard of ones to watch being good levels of engagement, one star being very good, two star being outstanding and three being world class. And so it's an accreditation of excellence. Now, we don't really know what average looks like in the um, UK market or even globally because we do survey globally. Uh, but what we do know is what great organizations are doing. And so what I thought would be good is to, is to take a look at the sort of population of um, these percentages in relationship to what we would identify as a good organization to work for. So as you can see, 27% of those responding to those two questions sit in that high engagement bucket on average, 18% highly satisfied. Um, we've got 14% neutrality, but yes, we have got 5% highly disengaged. 
And that just basically suggests that you're not gonna please all of the people all of the time. Now, what's interesting is if we compare that now to world class, the percentages here underneath are the percentages. So that effectively um, is 39% uh, of high engagement the three-star organization has. So overall, um, there's 9% less unpleasantness in a three-star organization compared to a good one, and 16% more pleasant. And you can see that the predominance of that is in this highly engaged area. What we can also see is there's a lot less neutrality um, in um, a three-star organization and a good one. And also there's less anxiousness. And the reason for that is because leaders in three-star organizations understand how important it is to constantly create uh, uh, organizational clarity. And not just create that organizational clarity, but constantly reinforcing that organizational clarity through multiple mediums, multiple times. Um, we knew from our research that pre-pandemic that actually um, people needed, employees needed to hear things seven times before they believe them, before they believe the messages from leadership and internalize them. And that's not because they're thick, it's just that they want to see that repetition uh, and regularity. At the beginning of the pandemic, that moved to 12 times, uh, uh, sorry, nine times. And now we believe it's 12 times. So that's really important, especially when there's such a uh, amount of negativity around. So leadership need to create that, um, that clarity of purpose. Why do we exist beyond that of making money? Clearly it is important to make money, but there needs to be a reason beyond that. It needs to be clear about the values, the behaviors that we're looking for need to be clear about where we're heading for in the next three to five years and the plan to get there. That's that's what we describe as organizational clarity. And the great organizations not only make sure that those leadership messages get out there, but they're reinforced by managers on the ground. So um, fundamentally, that's the snapshot of the difference between good, which is which is good, good levels of engagement and world class levels of engagement. Now, what I wanted to do now is, um, so that's the percentages. And just before we go off this, um, this number here, 39%, I've never seen in 23 years an organization that's achieved 100% in that highly engaged bucket. There's always a balance. And um, that number, 39%, pre-pandemic was 43%. So that's the impact of what's happened of the pandemic as well as this cost of living crisis. And it's that where that that 4% has gone, predominantly it's gone up into engage but ensure and a little bit towards neutrality. But I think what's also important to point out, even in a world-class organization, 3% of your colleagues are likely to be highly disengaged, um, even in a world-class organization. Now, just moving on, um, this is the methodology that we use. So we asked 24 scoring questions on our surveys and each one of those 24 scoring questions load onto one of the eight workplace factors. And you have to do well on all of these eight workplace factors to do well on what we call your BCI score, your best company's index score, which then gets driven, you know, and depending on what level that is, depends on whether or not you achieve good one star, uh, good ones to watch, one star, very good, two star outstanding, three extraordinary. Now, what we know and what's been consistent over these last 23 years is that for all organizations of all sizes, uh, whether it be for-profit, not-for-profit, as much as you have to do well on all of these eight workplace factors, there's three factors that drive engagement. And that is leadership, my manager, and personal growth. They are without doubt the most highly correlated. The thing that kills engagement is a lack of well-being. So I just wanna take a moment to just talk you through uh, the impact that uh, firstly a manager has, then leadership, and then how that impacts, um, uh, and also the, the personal growth um, and how that impacts overall engagement. So the impact of a great manager, and this is really being borne out through the pandemic, a great manager, firstly, um, you know, um, people join organizations and lead managers. Um, the, the statistics suggest that 7.5 out of 10 people leave their manager, not the organization. Um, and so that's really interesting. Um, um, I don't know how they get half a person, but 
the, the stats are the stats. And but a great manager sells the direction and vision of the organization and ensure others can see how their role impacts on the bigger picture. I'm sure that many of you have heard the story about the, the golden broom, uh, the janitor working at Cape Canaveral, um, and the president does a visit and asks, you know, uh, what do you do here? And, and the, the janitor replied, I help put people on the moon. And, and, and that's where somebody is really, their manager has helped them to understand the difference that they make. So if we do that well, then it improves the my company factor, the way that we feel about the organization. Great managers should look after the growth and development of their people. If we focus on their growth and development and actively encourage it, then they're gonna feel more engaged with what the man their manager and indeed the leadership wants to achieve. Great managers build great teams, we know that. Uh, this is really important to build a solid team foundation. But what we're measuring here is not the team that managers manage, it's the team that they sit on. So that's the, the, the cohesiveness of the, the, the directors of the organization, the senior managers, the middle managers, team leaders and team members. And what we're seeing in the data is that this new way of working has really challenged that concept of team, not specific, not necessarily specifically individual teams, but the way that teams work together. And so those breaking those silos down has always been a challenge for engagement, but it's an increasing challenge given the way that colleagues are, start, are now having to work remotely, not having to, choosing to. Last but not least, a manager has a big influence on the well-being of their colleagues. Because they're managing workload and workflow, they can have a big impact. Now, what we start, what we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, actually well-being went up at team member level because the focus quite rightly was to keep them safe, et cetera. But it, we saw a marked decline um, from a, the well-being of directors, senior managers, because they were having to navigate, what does this mean for us, this pandemic? And, and increasingly, you know, what was this cost of living crisis and cost of trading crisis gonna have? What impact is it gonna have? Now that well-being, um, in certain instances, because of the difficulty of the labour market, has created what, a lack of well-being further down the organisation. And as I mentioned earlier, leadership, my manager, personal growth drive engagement, but a lack of well-being can kill engagement. Leadership has a big impact the way that we feel about the organisation, but also it does have a big impact on well-being also, because they're creating often new strategies, being agile to accommodate the changing in the market um, in their particular sector perhaps but what can happen then is leadership's got to make sure that it has the capacity to make those changes because obviously there's a point at where those that new strategy has to meet the day job and that sometimes can create uh, a lack of well-being the my company factor the the statements in there are i love working for the organization i feel proud to work for the organization i'd leave tomorrow for another job all of those statements have one thing in common. You can't make people feel those emotions. So it's more of an output factor. When all the other seven factors are working well, then it actually manifests in that my company factor. Now, this is the last of the three driving factors, personal growth. I cannot tell you how important personal growth has been over the last 23 years and how much even more important it's been in these last two to three years. Because quite frankly, if we're investing in the growth and development of our colleagues, that gives them security. Not only does it give them security, but while people are really focused on this cost of living crisis, it gives them a, a, a line of sight that they could develop their remuneration package by taking on new skills and extra responsibilities. If we do have a lack of well-being and we have colleagues that are salaried in the organization, clearly if our well-being goes down but our salaries don't go up, then clearly that's going to have a negative impact on the way that we feel about the money that we get paid for doing the job. So that's really something that's very important. Now, pre-pandemic, we would say, and it's been consistent for 20 of those 23 years, fair deal is a hygiene factor. It needs to be at the right level, otherwise it's a disengager. But if it's at the right level, you know, in terms of market conditions, et cetera, then no additional amount of money beyond that is going to make people more engaged with the manager or indeed their leadership. It'll make them happier, but it won't make them more engaged. Now, that's all changed. We started to see this change 
in um, actually 12 months ago, in October, November, December of 2021, when we started to see the anxiousness of this cost of living crisis coming through the data. So what we're seeing now is uh, lots of organizations are having significant reductions in that fair deal scores, and that is having a negative impact on the way that we feel about leadership and the my company factor. Now, that is very consistent to many of the organizations that we're surveying. And the, the reason why that, I believe, is happening is that during the pandemic, people were looking towards, let's face it, government to address this sort of uh, the COVID crisis and, you know, uh, and the pandemic. And obviously, the result of that is that that has drained the resources of, of the country. So moving into this cost of living crisis, what's happened now is instead of looking to government to sort this challenge out of high inflation and higher uh, fuel costs and inflationary costs, they're looking to the leader, the leadership team of organizations and indeed the mic and the company itself. Um, many, uh, many individuals have said, you know, have the belief that, you know, that during the pandemic, you know, we helped the company to get through that. It's now the time of the company to help us through this cost of living crisis. But I'm also seeing leadership teams go, actually, wait a minute, we helped our, our, our employees through this crisis, and now it's their turn to pay back so that you can see the dynamic that's playing out. Now, just on this fair deal crisis, I wanted to share the creative things that organizations that we measure have been doing to try and, and, and minimize the impact of this. And uh, first one up is uh, Seven Stars. And Seven Stars is actually one of the UK's largest independent media agencies. They're based in London. And what they chose to do was that they actually, um, they, a lot of organizations are recognizing that what they put in place for COVID actually as, as a crisis situation, actually slightly tweaked is appropriate for the cost of living crisis. And it is a crisis and it should be dealt with as a crisis. So they extended an interest free lockdown loan of up to five thousand pounds to colleagues to ease that financial any financial hardships. And they've continued that on um uh to the financial crisis so anybody can apply for a lockdown loan up to five thousand pounds and they will then you know uh provide that loan and, and and have it repaid and that doesn't it's not a benefit in kind um i think actually now you can loan ten thousand pounds to an employee without it being a benefit in kind um pavers the um shoe retailer uh they were fairly innovative in the sense that um, they've created a saver to invest scheme where basically money saved within the business uh, by colleagues thinking about how they can reduce costs, then gets reinvested back into helping um, uh, increase staff hourly pay. So what the business has said, it's a it's a national business. Um, um, they've said, look, if we can identify cost savings, we'll take those cost savings and we'll actually um, put it into increased hourly wages for our colleagues. Um, this is Rudding Park. Um, this is a, um, a, a luxury spa hotel uh, um, uh, place in, in, in Harrogate, actually. And this is a piece of best practice that um, we've adopted. Um, specifically, they've also put cost of living crisis and they've uh, financial support um, in these sort of loan situations and providing that support. But this is what we chose to pick up on. Um, because a lot of their colleagues at Harrogate is quite a rural place uh, and certainly where Rudding Park is based, it's in Parkland. So they've actually decided to pay those colleagues that had to travel in from work. They looked at the cost pre the fuel price increases and actually said, right, we'll pay the difference between what those pre increased prices were in 2021 to what they are now. And we'll pay the difference to that. Um, every month in, your, in the wage packet. So that, that meant that they didn't have a financial, additional financial burden to get into work every day. And that's obviously important in the hospitality business. Crafted, um, well, Crafted is a digital marketing agency um, and it's 75 employees. Um, and effectively, what they did is in, in light of the cost of living crisis, they actually took their 
salary review process and brought it forward, I think about three months, and also brought forward a profit share payment so that people felt like that, that, that three months earlier meant that they felt more equipped to deal with these fuel price pressures and things coming through uh, from, an eco uh, from an economy perspective. Um, Makara Health. Makara Health is a pharmaceutical company based in Salisbury. It's only 75 people uh, on the one side in Salisbury. But what they did is they recognized this fuel price pressures and, and, and paid everybody, irrespective of uh, length of service position, an additional £700 to meet that extra cost that people were incurring from their um, um, energy bills. And by all accounts, they, they, can, they, they are going to continue to do that for as long as energy prices are high. Inspire Health, this is the um, defence contractor. And um, what they did is they um, increased wages by a minimum of 1,500, also introduced a temporary cost of living allowance, COLA allowance of £100 per month um, to help with additional living costs. What they've now done is they've now made that a permanent payment, um, recognizing that these aren't going down anytime soon. And last but not least, Hectare. Um, these are a software business, again, only 38 people, um, based um, down south. And they are focused on the supply chain for agricultural businesses. And what they did is, and you know, not everybody can do this, I appreciate it, but they actually wrote a check for everybody uh, as a bonus of £3,000 to help them manage these really difficult times. So obviously hugely appreciated. A small business and clearly software, you know, uh, that the margins perhaps allow for that. But yeah, that was certainly very appreciated. Now, just finishing off the eight factors, um, we've seen the um, fair deal and how creative organisations have been to try and figure out how they can get more money in the pocket of their employees during this challenging time. But also, one of the factors that we're very proud of identifying 23 years ago was the importance of giving something back. And this talks about giving back to the local wider community, the environment, uh, does the organisation have a strong social conscience, and does it help people from disadvantaged backgrounds? I'm very pleased to say that even in this crisis, people are still focused on this, WPR is a Birmingham-based uh, PR agency, 55 people based in Birmingham, and they identified that, that actually a, a, um, a Ladywood, uh, uh, which is a charity locally, they wanted to buy uh, uniforms for 30 children locally, where 54% of the 54 of the children were living in poverty. So, um, you know, really great that they were continuing to support those um, people that were struggling also with the cost of living increase. They also helped by uh, helping 30 families by installing LED bulbs, radiator reflectors, a window and door ins insulation to be able to help them reduce their energy costs. And finally, Stockport Homes Group. Um, this is a um, housing association based up in Stockport. And they come up, came up with a very innovative um, idea a, a couple of years ago, actually, to meet this challenge of food poverty. And, and they operate a local pantry network, and um, which is an affordable community food store offering both staff and residents uh, that need it, good quality food at low cost. And they've been able to um, effectively have 10,000 visits um, from over 600 members uh, to that, um, that initiative. So clearly it's really important to be able to give something back. So that's all I wanted to stay, say, and um, I, I don't know, hopefully there's some questions that Nikki's gonna be able to field. Um, and I always think that the Q and A part is the, by far the best uh, part of the session. Hi there, thanks Jonathan, that was great. Uh, the practical um, examples, particularly about what other businesses are doing at the end there was 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 uh, really, really helpful. Um, indeed, uh, we put in a what we call UMI hardship loan um, back at the start of the pandemic and it still runs today. And um, that the, the feature that financial well-being has 
in terms of how engaged people are and so on and so forth uh, really is quite um, significant versus other features, isn't it? So uh, we certainly felt that had a, a material benefit. And of course, not everybody can do it. But the other thing that I know that some businesses have done on that front is they've worked with some of the local um, uh, social credit uh, houses, et cetera, et cetera, instead of putting their own mechanisms in place, they've worked more asso assertively with some of those local solutions to broker in, um, you know, thoughtful, should I say, um, uh, credit advice and indeed credit itself. So um, really nice to hear that. In terms of um, some of the uh, questions that we've got, we've got a couple here. Um, so uh, I guess somebody's get, trying to get you to sort of hone, uh, hone the advice here. What are the top three things on a practical level that work the best for retaining talent? Uh, without, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's uh, no easy. Well, actually it is, it's actually listen. Uh, the importance of listening um, and finding ways uh, to listen. So obviously, you know, doing employee service, I'm gonna say is a good way of starting that listening process. But as good as that is, it's the com quality of the conversations um, that you're having. That is without doubt the most important thing. Um, um, the, the, I guess that listening piece, um, uh, the reason why it's important is lots of organisations are um, running fairly lean and because of the challenges in the labour market, etc. And the biggest single challenge is, as I mentioned earlier, a lack of well-being um, basically kills engagement. And that over time is gonna get people to vote with their feet. And I think the most important thing is, um, it's not just listening, is the effectiveness of management um, and the quality investing in our managers. Because what we see is actually where we've got a strong manager that appreciates their team, that recognizes their team, even with the same pay, they get higher fair deal scores than they do with a manager that doesn't appreciate their colleagues and doesn't really communicate with them. We get lower scores, even though the pay rate is the same. Now, I know that you can't bank appreciation, but it does make a difference, especially when people are working hard. So I would say listening. I, I would say um, uh, making sure that at every level and a lot of the challenges that people are facing is the lack of well-being at senior levels and management levels because they've got the job of middle managers taking the strategy and trying to deliver it and so that is a really difficult place to be so the most important thing is to make sure that we're looking after those people and they're clear uh, and we're not overloading them with too many initiatives and strategies um, the other thing that i would say is the power of bringing people together um, that is so important. Now, um, you know, there is obviously efficiency in the way that um, people work, um, uh, you know, the working from home, working flexibly, all is all good. But the organizations that we measure now are making it a strategic board level sort of conversation every month of how we bring in our teams together and investing significantly in that. And the third thing I would say is when things get tough, often people back off the personal growth, the, the, the growth and development, because it's an easy thing to um, cut. What I've got to be honest, I've got to be honest with you, it's the worst thing to cut because that's going to create anxiety. It's going to create um, uh, a sense of I'm not growing and developing. And as a result, that's going to get people to start to look to leave. And that in itself is, is obviously very expensive and, um, and and trying to get talent is, is really difficult. And obviously, as you mentioned, retaining talent. Um, so those are the three things I think that I, I would focus on. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, I just just to add from our own business perspective um, here at UMI, um, it's time's precious, isn't it? And sometimes people don't afford the time to do that listening that you write you know I think it's really really important that you talked about there but I guess I'd urge uh, owner managers particularly if you're in a smaller business and you don't have a big leadership and management team to support you in this use of the techniques it doesn't mean you have to sit down with people for lengthy periods 
you can show your team that you're listening to how they're feeling and what they're seeing as challenges by even just putting a box out there that they can put thoughts in and you can respond to um, online or maybe just gather them together and go through them really efficiently in half an hour. There's diff there's ways in which you can do it. It doesn't have to be, you know, lengthy kind of get togethers and multiple meetings and so on and so forth. But I'd absolutely concur with Jonathan on the power of your team feeling like they're being listened to. I mean, just after this session today, uh, I've got a brilliant afternoon ahead of me because we do a business update um, at least every couple of months where I share with the team um, how the business is doing. We celebrate things. We tackle challenges. And after that, we always use a good proportion of time, two to three hours to spend time together. And what we've decided as a business is that, you know, when we're apart from each other, if you are working remotely, we can be operationally productive. But what we need to focus on when we do spend the time to come together is we put equal value on being um, culturally productive and collaborative. So this afternoon, normally we use those sessions to do as uh, tackle some business business challenges, but with daft games and things. Today we're just going to have a bit of fun. And it does feel like a real luxury because just like you, we're having to work really, really hard to generate revenues, manage costs, be more efficient. But I'm absolutely convinced that it reaps rewards and dividends and far greater than doing a bit of cost management um, in, in the longer run. So I'd absolutely agree with that point. Thanks, Jonathan. And um, the other one, this, this other question that I've got is, is quite interesting, actually. And I think somebody's picked up on the fact that you guys obviously span countries as well. And, and some yeah. of the surveys that you do um, has businesses participate in it from other countries. There's a question here around, do you notice that businesses in other countries do things differently from a point of view of engagement, talent retention? And if so, what are they? It's interesting that both, um, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, is there a lot of difference between sectors, a lot of difference between regions, lot, uh, and those regions being geographical regions? Um, and the answer is engagement's the same. It's there's a consistent thing um, that goes right across it. The only thing that I would say is that uh, we do do global surveys and certainly when we survey or, um, countries like China, et cetera, they've got more of a compliant approach um, to filling out information. So you do get slightly higher scores because there's more of a compliant approach. Um, but generally speaking, in every country, I think we survey in 27 countries in the world, um, the eight factors are absolutely consistent. And it's always about leadership, my manager, personal growth, and um, and the lack of well-being um, is uh, is the challenge. And I think uh, what's interesting is, um, you know, we can think that we, as individual organisations, we're we're suffering this by ourselves. We're not. Every bit of data I'm seeing is is people are finding it challenging. But this is not a UK issue. Um, issues of labour, attracting and retaining labour cost of um uh, of living crisis uh, is impacting pretty much every other country so these are challenges globally when we're not by ourselves there are certain things that we are more susceptible to for, for for different reasons um but yeah we're all in the same boat and it's how we support each other to try and get that um sorted but i think the most important thing is it can feel very isolating when in your own business and uh, rest assured everybody's finding it challenging but if we can move that to what's the opportunity and the opportunity is always through engaging with your people brilliant that's great thanks jonathan we'll uh leave it there and um we'll wrap up the session but i'm really really grateful for you attending um and i'm sure people can reach out to you on linkedin or whatever else if you've got some yeah. um stuff that they want to follow up 